Hi and welcome to another story and today we have part three of Project Fairy by Jacqueline Wilson continuing from chapter six. I thought bindweed was mocking me. I could see the reflection of myself in the looking glass. My white face with a pink nose, just like a little white rat. My long pale straggly hair, my spindly arms and legs, my big feet, my bright pink dress with limp wings. Some fairy. Yet bindweed was very pale too and her nose was pink with excitement. Her green ringlets straggled. Her arms and legs were so spindly they looked in danger of snapping, and her feet in her green pointy shoes were the largest part of her. Her dress was white, but she had said Queen Mabe wore a rose-coloured dress. My wings didn't work, but what bindweed didn't know that, did she? Did she truly think I was a fairy queen? Surely I was fifty times too tall. Bindweed craned her neck, looking me up and down. This was clearly troubling her too. Why are you so elongated, your majesty? she asked. I fought hard. A witch put a wicked spell on me, I said, thinking up a story fast. I really wanted her to believe I was a fairy queen. She'd maybe show me some respect then. Bindweed frowned. Please don't tease me, she said. As if I'd do that, I said. It's true. It's most unfortunate, but there's no way the spell can be broken. The witch sent my father, the king, into exile and then put a spell on my mother and my brother too. So we have to live as human beings and lumber about like them. I was getting quite carried away. I could even see this witch, her face distorted with malice, her crooked finger pointing at us as she cast her spell. But Bindweed put her hands on her hips and shook her small head at me. There are no such things as witches, she said sternly. They are human women who practice herbal medicine and act as midwives. They might have broomsticks in their humble cottages, but they are for sweeping the hearth. They cannot fly. They keep evil black cats to be avoided at all costs, but they cannot cast spells. I am not a little child to be fobbed off with nonsense, Queen Mabe. I swallowed hard. You must have faith, little Bindweed, I said grandly. We fairies must flock together. Bindweed seemed to be losing faith rapidly. Tell me about your royal protocol, she said suspiciously. I didn't know what the word protocol meant. Did she mean duties and routine? What would fairy queens do all day when they weren't being driven around in golden carriages? Bindweed wasn't going to be impressed with an account of my own day-to-day -day life, either at home or at school. I tried to translate it. I like, uh, I take counsel with the dear Queen Mother and I assist the little Crown Prince, I said. I study hard and battle with unruly commoners. I am amused by Mickey, the court jester, I said. Plus, I rescue small fairies who've been imprisoned in books. I added for good measure. Hmm, said Bindweed. She circled me, peering up at my wings. And do you fly often? When the mood takes me, I replied cautiously. Then fly now, she said. But I'm not in the mood now, I said. I'm very tired. Just fly up to the ceiling and back like this, said Bindweed. She spread her own wings and flapped them a little. Drops of water made a minute puddle on the rug. She still hadn't dried out properly from her dunk in the water glass. She had to flap hard for a moment or two, her face screwed up with effort. But at last she gathered strength and her wings shone. She stood on tiptoe in her pointy green boots and took off, whirling upwards in the air with a strange small hum like a tiny mosquito. She buzzed around my head, even landing on my shoulder for a second, smiling at me, her green eyes gleaming. And then she flew down and down in a spiral and landed gracefully, her white dress belling out around her. There, she gasped, breathing heavily. Now it's your turn. I'm out of practice, I said quickly. I'm pretty sure you haven't been crushed in a book for years like me, but I managed it, said Bindweed. There's not enough room. I'll hit my head on the ceiling, I protested. Bindweed looked at me with contempt. Excuses, excuses, she said. You can't fly, can you? You're not any kind of fairy, let alone a new Queen Mabe. You're simply a pathetic imposter. She was beginning to sound like a tiny version of Kathy. I started to tremble. I'll show you, I said, and I took a gigantic leap upwards, arms outspread. I hoped that somehow sheer determination would power me up into the air, even if I couldn't quite reach the ceiling. I failed miserably. My wings didn't even flap. I went crashing downwards and landed in a heap on the carpet. Mabe, are you all right, darling? Mum called from the living room. She came rushing in to check, while Bindweed scuttled under the bed. How did you fall over? Mum asked anxiously. Have you hurt yourself? I'm fine, Mum, I said, getting to my feet. You're wearing your fairy dress, said Mum, sounding tremendously pleased. I wasn't sure you really liked it. Well, I do, really, I said. It makes me feel like a fairy queen. Oh, darling, Mum gave me a hug. So where does it hurt? Nowhere. I was just dancing about and tripped over my own feet, I said. Probably because you've got one slipper on and one slipper off, said Mum. Better put the other one on now, pet. I, I'm not sure where it is, I said. You've probably kicked it under the bed, said Mum. 
Let me look, I said urgently, and practically pushed her out of the way. I peered under the bed. Bindweed had climbed in my, into my slipper again and was huddled inside. I picked her up as gently as I could with my thumb and forefinger. She waggled her skinny arms and legs in protest as I deposited her on the floor and pulled my slipper out into the daylight. Here it is, I said. Pop it on then. And home and come and watch a bit of telly with Robin and me, said Mum. It's nearly time. Mum didn't watch the news at six o'clock. She hated seeing anything worrying or upsetting. She watched quiz shows instead. Sometimes I thought she liked them even more than her fairies. She liked House of Games most of all. She didn't guess many of the answers. She just liked watching Richard Osman because he was so kind and gentle. She chatted to him while he was on. That's right, you keep them guessing, Richard. <laughs> You're so clever and you know so much. But you look a bit tired today. No wonder you work so hard. Yet you keep smiling, don't you, pet? She murmured. It was as if he was part of our family. Robin used to think he could really hear us and would say hello and goodbye to him and wave. I sat on the sofa with Mum and Robin and Fido and imagined having a chat with Richard Osman myself. Hi, Richard. Do you think, uh, do you happen to know anything about fairies? I mean, I know they don't exist, but the thing is, there's a real one underneath my bed. She's not actually very nice. She's very grumpy and bosses me around, but I think that's because she's worried. I'm so big and she's so tiny and scared of being squashed. She's made me swear not to tell anyone about her, but it doesn't count talking to you inside my head because you can't actually hear me. So what am I going to do about her? Richard smiled on the television and said cheerfully, well, should we find out the right answer? I wish he could. I pretended I needed to go to the loo and dashed into the bedroom instead. I kneeled down and peered under the bed. I couldn't see anything at all for a moment and panicked. But then I saw Bindweed had wrapped herself in one of the little rolls of dust, wearing it like a shawl. I could just see her green cap and her pointy green boots sticking out at either end. Bindweed, I whispered. It's all right. It's only me, Mabe. She didn't answer. She was making a tiny sound like the weeniest sniffles. Oh, don't cry, I whispered. I put my hand out to try to reassure her, but she scurried further under the bed. I haven't told Mum and Robin about you, I promise. I'm going to look after you and keep you safe, I murmured. There was another tiny sniff. I don't want you to look after me, she said. I am at least 170 years older than you, probably more. I wasn't sure this could possibly be true. Nobody lived to that extreme age. It would make her a, a Victorian. We'd be learning about them at school, but Bindweed wasn't just anybody. She was a fairy. Still, I'm much bigger and stronger than you are, I said, and I can bring you honey and water, and you can sleep in my slipper and hide under the bed. That's not much of a life, Bindweed wept. I'll be your prisoner. I've already been trapped in that book for so many years, and now you want to lock me up again. I had to agree she had a point. You'll have the flat to yourself during the day, though. There are all sorts of things you'll like, special fairy things. You wait and see. You'll be able to sit on a chair exactly the right size and jump up and down on a toadstool and dip your toe in a fairy pool. I could even fill it with dew. There, you couldn't have found a better home. We've got a hundred and one fairy things. It's practically fairyland already, and I'm Queen May, right? Wrong, Bindweed hissed. You can't fly. Well, perhaps I can't right at the moment. I'm in human disguise, see? Humans can't fly, so my wings have lost their power and gone all droopy. So, of course, I can't fly just like that. You found it pretty difficult at first, didn't you? And there's so much more of me now, so it's harder for me to stop being earthbound. But inside I'm little and light and still a fairy. A fairy queen. Nonsense, said Bindweed, venturing out from under the bed. I'll prove it, I said, thinking fast. I didn't think most people in Victorian days had electricity, and if she had been trapped later, well, she had been living outdoors. I ran to the light switch. I can make the sun come out with one flick of my finger, I said, and demonstrated. Light flooded the room. Bindweed reeled backwards, screwing her eyes up. Have you set the room on fire, you mad giant, she cried. Douse me in your water glass. There's no need to panic. It's not fire, I promise. It's only light, magic light, and I can make it disappear with a flick of my finger. I said, and I touched the switch again. See, now it's gone, and yet I can make it come back. It's magic, isn't it? Admit it, Bindweed, I said triumphantly. She sniffed. It's some devious trickery, she said. Repeat it if you can. Certainly, I said. OK, on. And now off. On, off. On, off. Mabe, are you mucking about with the light? Mum called from the living room. Don't do that, darling. You'll fuse it. We don't need the light on at all yet. It's not dark. Sorry, Mum, I called. Are you coming back to watch telly with us? She asked. In a minute, I yelled. Aha, television. I was pretty certain they didn't have televisions in Fairyland. 
I bent down to bind Weed's level. Let me carry you into the room next door. You will see little people that I've enchanted. I've made them tiny, not much bigger than you, and squashed them inside a big flat box. Mum and Robin love to watch them. You're talking nonsense, Bindweed said. This is a trap. You just want to show me to them, and then I'll be squashed into a box for people to gawp at. I told you, I'm not going to show you to anyone. I promise, promise, promise. Look at me, pick you up and put you down my top. You can hide there when we go into the living room and peep out when it's safe. I'm quite skinny and the fairy costume was on the big side. There was plenty of room. I held out the top of the bodice invitingly. Come on, Bindweed, hop in. She shook her head fiercely, backing away from me, but I made a sudden grab at her and stuffed her down my dress before she could escape. She struggled violently, trying to climb out, but I clamped my hand over the little lump near my waistband, not hard enough to hurt her, simply to keep her still. Let me out, she shrieked, trying to kick me with her pointy boots. Shh, now, you don't want Mum and Robin to hear you, do you? I said, and I ran into the living room. I felt Bindweed flatten herself right at the bottom of the bodice, just above the waistband. She was trying to stay still, but I could feel her trembling. I felt horribly mean, but I knew I wasn't really putting her at any risk. Mum and Robin were glued to the television, cuddled up on the sofa. Robin had Fido on his lap so that he could hardly see the screen, let alone me. Fido's wheels were pressing down on his bare legs, which must have been uncomfortable, but Robin didn't seem to mind. He didn't know the answer to any of Richard's games, but cheerily shouted out nonsense each time. Mum didn't know any answers either, but didn't let it go, get her down. Whenever Richard Osman looked directly at the camera and asked how we at home were getting on, Mum would giggle. Oh, Richard, you know what I'm like with geography, she'd say. It's no use asking me about pop songs. I'm rubbish at that. She smiled when she saw me. Here's our little fairy, she said. I heard the smallest shriek inside my bodice. Bindweed clearly thought she'd been spotted. Yes, I'm your fairy, Maeve, I said quickly, twirling around so they wouldn't spot Bindweed scurrying about frantically. Mum patted the space on the sofa. Come and cuddle up with us, Mabe, she said. I don't want to crush my lovely fairy frock, I said, sitting on the armchair beside them and spreading my skirts primly. They could only see me sideways there, and if Bindweed suddenly tried to make a bolt for freedom, I'd have more chance of stopping her without them seeing. I clasped my hands lightly over the tiny lump of Bindweed, stroking her with the tips of my fingers. I felt little pokes as if she was trying to brush them aside, but after a few minutes she quietened, though she still felt very tense. I knew she was listening. She could hear Mum. She could hear Robin. She could hear Robin make Fido bark. But she could also hear Richard Osman and his four contestants. Bindweed started stealthily climbing upwards inside my bodice. She paused right at the top for a full two minutes. And then I felt her ringlets tickling me as she poked her head right out above the satin. She jerked violently when she saw the television. Little people inside my magic box. She pressed back against my chest. Perhaps she really thought I'd trap her inside the television too. She watched intently, starting whenever any music was played, and ducked down at the end of the show when they played the signature tune. Can I pick a programme now, Mum? I asked. She threw me the remote. I flicked through channel after channel, showing off my magic powers to Bindweed. I craftily chose an animal programme set in Africa. Bindweed trembled as lions roared and elephants trumpeted. I didn't want to scare her too much, so I channel hopped again to a cartoon on children's television. This seemed to startle her even more, but it was an advert that got the most reaction from her. An advert for washing up liquid. She was so furious, she threw away all sense of caution. That abomination is not a fairy, she declared. She only had a tiny voice, but Mum heard. What did you say, Mabe? I didn't quite catch it, she said, turning her head to me. Bindweed scooted down my bodice again. Oh, I was just, uh... Just pretending to be a fairy, I said. You are sweet, darling. It's lovely that you're really getting into the whole fairy world now. But fairies would never ever talk like that, in little screechy voices. I've never been lucky enough to hear one, of course, but they say they talk in this wonderful melodic way. Rather like the tinkling of bells, said Mum. Oh, is that right, I said, hardly able to keep a straight face. If only Mum knew she'd heard a real fairy just then. I ached to tell her. It would mean the whole world to her. But I couldn't betray Bindweed. I wasn't sure I even liked Bindweed because she was so rude and demanding and I was certain she couldn't stand me but I felt compelled to protect her all the same. She was keeping totally still and silent now, curled into a tight little ball. I cupped my hands very carefully over her and this time she didn't poke me. She stayed still and very slowly I felt her spread out a little, relaxing. At seven o'clock mum went off to bath Robin. 
He was probably old enough to bath himself, but he still needed supervision to make sure he didn't simply play fountains with an old shampoo bottle rather than scrubbing himself. When I heard the bath taps running and Robin's giggles as mum tickled him, I gave Bindweed a little pat. It's okay. They'll be gone ages. Shall I show you around the living room? It's got a lot of fairy stuff, but I'm not sure you'll approve. I whispered down my fairy dress front. Bindweed climbed upwards and emerged, her hair sticking up wildly, her white dress crushed, her wings as limp as my own. Oh dear, I said, standing her on the palm of my hand. I did my best to tidy her up with my other hand, arranging her curls and smoothing out the creases from her dress. She flapped her wings herself until they spread out, the delicate green veins glowing. Thank you, she said, surprisingly meekly. She peered around the room, astonished. I can make it prettier, I said, and I carried her over to the fairy light switch. I put them on to flash mode, turning it up high. Mum loved it when they flashed very rapidly because your eyes started to play tricks and you could really believe you saw a fairy in the dazzle. Robin and I liked it too because it was like a disco party and we could dance around wildly in the sparkling light. I hope Bindweed might like it as well. She gave a small cry of pain and bent double, putting her hands over her eyes. You're blinding me, she gasped. Oh, I feel so sick. She clutched her tiny tummy and groaned. I'm so, so sorry, I said, switching them off. Just lie still a moment with your eyes closed. I didn't realise the effect they would have on you. But of course, it must feel totally overpowering when you have such small eyes. Indeed, Bindweed murmured, and then she rallied a little. Actually, many fairy folk tell me my eyes are my finest feature because they are so big, she added. Yes, but they're like little beady insect eyes compared to mine, I said. Are you comparing me to an insect again? Bindweed demanded. How dare you? Such lowly revolting creatures. Well, mum had a flock of pewter fairies riding ladybirds and grasshoppers along the windowsill, but fairies and insects clearly didn't get along in real fairy life. I still couldn't quite believe in Bindweed. Even though there she was in front of my eyes, flopping about in my hand and yawning with nausea. I could see her. I could feel her. I could hear her. I could even smell her. I thought fairies would smell of roses like the fairy potion mum had sent for once on the internet. We'd thought it didn't smell too bad at first, but the pale golden colour darkened very quickly. It soon reeked of stagnant water and mum had to throw it away. After that she made her own, out of rose water and glycerine. Bindweed didn't smell rosy or stagnant, thank goodness. She had a strange, fresh, earthy sort of smell, like rain and wind and grass. It was very slight but distinct, and I rather liked it. I bent nearer to take a deep breath of it. Don't, Bindweed screamed. Don't what, I asked. Come so close to me. It's horrible, she said. I only wanted to look at you properly, that's all, I said. Really hurt. Did she think I was horrible? You looked as if you might swallow me, said Bindweed. As if I'd do that, I said. Well, you said you nearly did exactly that, Bindweed snapped. That was a total accident, and I didn't swallow you. I spat you straight out, I said. And it was like I was giving you the kiss of life. I thought you were grateful. I am, Bindweed conceded reluctantly. You should be extra polite to me anyway, because I am your fairy queen, I said. So you say, said Bindweed. I can do magic tricks, can't I? I said. So can the Lord of Darkness, said Bindweed, and he is an expert shapeshifter. I blinked at her. She didn't seriously think I was the devil, did she? The thought made me feel really powerful. I think you should be extra respectful then, just in case, I said. So, I'll give you a grand tour of the living room now. Poor mum. Bindweed was unimpressed with all her precious fairy ornaments. In fact, she shuddered several times. She thought the little pewter fairies hideous and pulled faces at them. I invited her to sit down on one of the little twig chairs mum had made so painstakingly. But she said it was much too hard and she might get splinters. She didn't even like the beautiful little fairy house with a roof carved to look like ivy leaves. I can't abide here, dearer, she said. Its common name is ivy, and it is common. Nasty, creeping, sinister stuff. She peered inside the latticed window. It isn't furnished inside, she complained. She tried pushing the little wooden door. You can't even open it, she added. What's the point of a home you can't get into? Perhaps I could make you a proper home, I said. I was quite good at making things out of cardboard boxes. Mum often carted several home from the supermarket because they were simply put out for recycling. She used them for extra storage, as our furniture was a bit sparse. I could squash all my t-shirts and socks and knickers into just one box and use the other to make a fairy house for bindweed. I could let her keep my slipper for her bed and use tissues as a ready supply of clean sheets. Maybe I could build her a table out of Lego. But how could I make her a soft chair and a bath? And what did fairies do when they needed to go to the toilet? 
Bindweed was such a picky little creature. If she turned her nose up at Mum's lovingly made fairy furniture, she'd find mine very makeshift. It's kind of you to suggest making me a home, said Bindweed, but I have a home. Now that I'm rested and recovered, please, will you take me there? Chapter 7 Where's your home, Bindweed? I asked. I live on the Wentworth estate, she said proudly. On the Wentworth estate, I repeated, astonished. There were lots of blocks of flats in our town, and some of them were lovely, but the Wentworth estate was like a grim concrete fortress with burnt-out cars and piles of rubbish in the grounds. There were nice kids there, of course, but some of the Wentworth kids would beat you up if you dared even look at them. Their dogs were all illegal fighting breeds and might tear you to shreds if you went anywhere near them. The Wentworth gangs didn't just have knives, they had guns. I hadn't actually seen any of this for myself. I would never have dared put one foot in Wentworth territory, but I was certain it was all true. Are you sure you mean the actual Wentworth estate? The one up Fairmount Hill? I asked. Yes, of course, said Bindweed. She clutched hold of my finger earnestly. You will take me there, won't you? I'm not sure I could manage to fly all the way by myself, and I, I might get confused. I haven't lived there for so long. Indeed, I haven't lived at all for many years. I've been squashed in between the pages of a book in a state of suspension. Please, please, please take me back to dear Wentworth. I'm not sure the Wentworth estate is quite how you're remembering it. It's a bit, uh, wild now, I said. I am a member of the Convervulus family. We embrace wildness. Given our way, we'd turn every ornamental garden into a delightful tangle. Oh, I'm faint with longing. Please, can we go there immediately? We can't go there now. It's nearly bedtime, I said. I imagined going to the Wentworth estate at night when the gangs were prowling. Oh, for goodness sake, you're as bad as my pretentious cousin, Morning Glory. Ridiculous name, Bindweed said a little enviously. She wilts in the afternoon and curls up fast asleep until sunrise, the idle wench. Very well, first thing tomorrow. I have to go to school. A great girl like you still goes to school? You're not exactly a, exactly a tiny bud, are you? said Bindweed. I wish you'd stop being so mean to me. It's especially silly when you're trying to get me to do something for you, I said. I heard a swoosh from the bathroom and Robin's chuckles as mum lifted him out and wrapped him up in a towel. Look, we'll have to discuss it later. It's my turn to have a bath now. I like to have a bath in the morning dew, says Bindweed. I can't wait to be out of doors. It's so stuffy in this home of yours. I don't know how you bear it. I feel faint for lack of air. She gave a great yawn, which ended in a frightened gulp because mum put her head round the door. Have you got hiccups, said mum, as Bindweed dived down my bodice. You're clutching your chest. Does it hurt? No, no, I I'm fine, I said quickly. Well, time for your bath now, darling. I'm just putting Robin into his gym jams, said mum. Coming. Bindweed had to come with me whether she wanted to or not. The bathroom was hot and steamy now, like a tropical jungle. Mum always let me have a long bath in peace. I usually like to read, with my head propped up comfortably on a rolled-up towel, though sometimes the towel slipped and fell in the water, and once or twice the book dropped in too, which made the pages ripple afterwards. There was no chance of a peaceful read with Bindweed around. I fished her out of my fairy dress and sat her in the soap dish. It had a fairy pattern, inevitably. Bindweed wrinkled her nose at it, but liked the smell of the soap. It reminds me of a friend of mine. Dear honeysuckle, she said, sighing. Oh, I can't wait to see all my friends again. I'm even looking forward to seeing Morning Glory. I won't go as far as Ivy, though. He is my worst ever enemy. I have one of those, I said. Her name's Kathy, and she's mean to me. Even meaner than you. I won't be the slightest bit mean if you take me home to Wentworth tomorrow, said Bindweed. Please, please say you'll do so. She clasped her tiny hands imploringly. I'll have to think about it, I said, topping up Robin's bath with hot water and shaking in lots of bubble bath. Bindweed could feel the steam on her face. A hot waterfall, she said, fanning herself extravagantly. Yes, I can make it stop just like this, I said, turning off the tap. She looked moderately impressed, but then I had to get in the bath. I felt ridiculously shy getting undressed in front of Bindweed. She would stare so... I had no idea what fairy bodies were like under their dresses, but surely they were pretty similar to mine. My fairy dress looked pathetic crumpled on the bath mat. The label showed, saying, Fairy Princess. The wings were obviously made of cheap gauzy material, stretched over their bendy wire. Bindweed's own beautiful wings twitched slightly, as if in contempt. Running water always makes me desperate to go to the toilet, and that was even more embarrassing with Bindweed's beady eyes fixed on me. I flushed the toilet quickly, hoping she would think it was another magic trick, and jumped in the bath. Bindweed was splashed a little bit and clearly wasn't pleased, 
but kept quiet for a minute or two, and then she started up a very tiny mumbling. I couldn't hear her properly at first. It was just a little insect whine, but it got louder. Please take me home to Wentworth tomorrow. Please take me home. I will die of longing if you don't take me. Please, 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 you've saved my life once, oh magical Mabe. Please save me again and take me home tomorrow. It got louder and louder. She seemed to be droning right inside my ear. The noise went round and round inside my head, driving me crazy. All right, I said. Just stop that awful noise. She stopped immediately. You promise? She demanded. If I can, I said warily. You can do anything if you're a fairy queen, said Bindweed. Don't push it, I said. I scooped some frothy bath water onto my hands and blew a stream of bubbles at her. She squealed and tried to catch one. It disappeared and she looked so surprised and laughed out loud. Do it again, she said. I blew and blew and she watched the bubbles enchanted. She left her little soap dish thrown and started flying through the air, popping the bubbles with her tiny fingers, laughing too. It seemed so weird to be playing a game with an ancient and extremely cantankerous fairy. Exactly how, how old are you, Bindweed? I asked. She shrugged her small shoulders. I am over 150 years old, possibly 180. I could even be 200. I know your queen was on the throne when I was born. Queen Elizabeth, I said. I'm not that old, said Bindweed, but we are all taught about Queen Elizabeth when we are seedlings. She was a great and glorious personage. She was even given the honorary title of Fairy Queen, though, of course, human blood ran in her veins. I think that was maybe the first Queen Elizabeth, I said. We had learned about the Tudors at school. I tried to think of another queen. Queen Victoria, I suggested. That's the very one, said Bindweed. So you truly are a real Victorian. Oh, Bindweed, can you tell me all about the Victorian age? I've got to do a special project for Mrs Horsley at school. She'd be dead impressed if I did the Victorians. Well, humans were much the same as th then as now. I didn't have much to do with them, like all sensible fairies. Either the huge gruff ones stamp on you with their heavy boots or the small soft ones grab at you and try to keep you in a matchbox. I hid in the hedgerow whenever they came near. Even the fine folk in Wentworth House were uncouth sometimes, making merry till all hours and playing music loud enough to scare the birds, said Bindweed, shaking her head, especially when I was older and all the young humans seemed to do little but dance and have parties. It certainly, it certainly sounded much the same. I'd heard about the all-night raves at Wentworth, I wasn't sure where this hedgerow was, but it definitely didn't seem the sort of place to go bird spotting. The Wentworth gang, I'd been told, would use any stray starling or sparrow for target practice, or any child come to that. I shivered, even though my bath was still hot. It was so worrying that I couldn't sleep properly that night. Mum and Robin were tucked up together, fast asleep in the big bed. Bindweed wasn't stirring in the slipper under my little bed. I tossed and turned, trying to work out what to do. I couldn't ask Mum to come for a stroll around the Wentworth estate before or after school. She'd think I'd lost the plot. She wouldn't take Robin or me there in a million years. She didn't even let me play outside in our road because she thought some of the children were too rough. And I couldn't possibly go there by myself either. It was much too scary. I'd simply have to make it plain to Bindweed that it was far too dangerous. She couldn't make me take her. I didn't have to do what she said, even if she was a fairy. I wasn't scared of her. Was I? Well, I suppose I was just a little bit. It seemed ridiculous to be frightened of a tiny creature no bigger than a mouse. She was little and helpless for all her bossy ways. She couldn't do anything bad to me. It only tickled when she poked me with her little fingers and kicked me with her pointy boots. But if she was a real fairy, and there was no doubting that now, it meant she was magic. Maybe she could cast a spell on me, a wicked enchantment like the bad fairy in the Sleeping Beauty story. I wasn't a beauty and we didn't have any spindles, whatever they were, so I couldn't prick my finger on one. But it would almost be a relief to put to sleep for a hundred years because I hadn't slept a wink for most of the night and I was desperately tired. I tried to think of other wicked spells. Wasn't there a story about a proud girl who upset a fairy and had toads come spilling out of her mouth whenever she opened it? That sounded pretty disgusting, but I could always aim that at Kathy if she was being particularly mean to me. I couldn't help chuckling even though I was so worried. It was a faint echo from under the bed. Was that bindweed laughing too? I slipped out of bed and looked underneath it. I couldn't see anything because it was pitch black, but I could hear the little chuckling sound. Or was it sobbing? Bindweed? I whispered and felt around in the dark. I touched the brocade of my slipper. I felt Bindweed's soft dress, her long strange curls, her tiny face. Her cheeks were wet. Oh, Bindweed, don't cry, I said, scooping her into my hand. 
She didn't resist. She just lay there limply, making small forlorn sobs. I wrapped my fingers around her and lifted her up into bed with me. I put her on my pillow and pulled my duvet up to her little chin. There now, I said, giving her a gentle pat. All the fight seemed to have gone out of her. She stayed still, though her body quivered every time she sobbed. Are you very unhappy? I whispered. I felt her nod. What can I do to make you feel better? I asked. She made a huge effort to speak instead of sob. Wentworth, she murmured. I knew she was going to say it, but it didn't seem as if she was simply being artful to get her own way. She seemed genuinely sad. I was suddenly frightened she might fade away altogether. Could fairies die of a broken heart? I could feel my own heart thumping hard. It was bringing back those awful memories of mum sobbing all the time when dad had left us. She'd hardly seemed to know Robin and I were there. She'd cried and cried and we didn't know what to do. It was the scariest time of my life. I had to tell someone and then mum got taken away to get help and we got taken away too. Our foster mum was really kind to us but we cried too because we wanted to go home so badly. I'll take you to Wentworth tomorrow, Bindweed, I whispered. I promise I will. Bindweed still sobbed, but she reached out her arms and clasped my finger tight. After a few minutes, her grip relaxed and she seemed to be asleep. I stayed awake, wondering how on earth I could take her there. I must have fallen asleep at some point because I dreamed I was running through the Wentworth estate, pursued by boys with toad faces and flippers for feet, trying to smear me with, smear me with slime. I woke with such a start that I woke Bindweed too. Mabe, she said hoarsely. She'd hurt her throat with all the crying. It's all right. I was only having a bad dream, I said, shuddering. Are you still taking me to Wentworth? She asked. Yes, I promised, didn't I? I said. And all of a sudden I knew how I was going to do it. It was such a daring plan that it shocked me. I'd always been such a goody-goody. I was the sensible girl who looked after her mum and her little brother and was the teacher's pet at school. Now I was going to do something that even Mickey Flynn would balk at if I could get away with it. I could hear mum going into the bathroom. Robin ran into my room and jumped into bed with me. I had the best dream ever, Mabe. Fido turned into a real dog, but without his little wheels and the push-along bit. He could run all by himself and he kept leaping up and licking my knees. Truly he did, Robin said, bouncing about with excitement. Keep still, Robin, I said urgently. Bindweed had scurried under my pillow and he was likely to squash her flat. No, let's play bouncy castle, said Robin, standing up and jumping. Stop it, I said. You're making me feel sick. Why don't you go and have a good peer at Fido in case your dreams come true? Robin hurried off. I peered anxiously underneath my pillow. Bindweed was hunched in a ball, arms over her head. Was it an earthquake? She groaned. No, just my little brother. Look, he'll only be gone a minute. We'll have to be quick, I said, leaping out of bed and fetching my school bag. Climb in. Bindweed looked inside the dark school bag. It was a jumble of notebooks and pencils and chocolate wrappers and a forgotten half sandwich. I suppose it didn't look very inviting. I'm not going in there, she protested. You'll have to. Look, I'll wrap you up in a sock so it's more comfy, I said. A sock? Bindweed sounded appalled. A clean one. Please hurry. You don't want Robin or Mum to see you, do you? I said urgently. But why can't I simply pop back into the slipper under your bed? Bindweed moaned. Because I'm taking you to school with me, I whispered. To school? Bindweed repeated, horrified. I can't go to your school. The other children would see me and your, your teacher would think I was a butterfly and whack me with her cane. I'm going to keep you totally hidden. And teachers don't have canes now. And even if, even if they did, Mrs Horsley would never, ever whack you. She's lovely. She'd be totally in awe of you. She'd keep me as a specimen under glass. I've heard tell of several fairies enduring a living death in those exact circumstances, Bindweed hissed. Look, you're just jolly well going to have to trust me, I insisted. Do you want to go to Wentworth or not? Of course I want to go to Wentworth, said Bindweed. Well, this is the only way I can think of. All you have to do is stay in my school bag and keep quiet, OK? What about my breakfast? I'll see if I can find you something, I said, getting a sock from, um, uh, from my underwear box and wrapping it around her. She fussed irritably and protested as I picked her up and put her into my school bag, but without as much vigour as before. I carried the bag over to the window and had a careful look at her in daylight. She really didn't look very well at all. Her head lolled wearily and her white face had purple marks under her eyes like tiny bruises. She wasn't acting to try to get me to take her to the Wentworth estate. She seemed really to be languishing, frighteningly so. All those years hibernating in a book and now I'd woken her up again, given her life. But for how long? I left the school bag on my bed, carefully propped upright. 
I'll be back soon, Bindweed. Try to have a little nap, I whispered, giving the bag a pat. And then I hurried to get washed and dressed and have my breakfast. Mum had brought a bashed packet of sugary cornflakes back from the supermarket. I poured myself a bowlful and slipped a few into my pocket too. Bindweed seemed to have a sweet tooth, so she might like to crunch on them, as if they were giant pieces of sweet toast. I munched mine hurriedly, and then, while Robin was still spooning his up, I went to look at the fairy paintings book again. I wouldn't look at that book too often. It'll give you nightmares, said Mum, though of course it was very kind of Mrs Horsley to give it to you. I flipped through the paintings, pausing only to give the golden-haired man a little prod with my finger. I turned the pages until I found the picture of the fairy's funeral. I stared at it, my heart beating fast. Bindweed looked as white and waxy as the poor dead fairy, lying on the leaf, one hand on her stomach, the other hanging down uselessly. Mum, can fairies actually die? I asked. Darling, don't, said Mum, her eyes swivelling towards Robin. He wasn't taking any notice, simply shoveling in his cornflakes while humming a tune at the same time. But do they? I persisted. I mean, there aren't many around now, are they? So they must have mostly died off. I suppose their numbers have dwindled here. They, they must have all gone to fairyland, said Mum brightly. She hated to tell me anything upsetting. But they can die, I said, pointing to the picture. This shows a fairy's funeral, see? Yes, but that's a very morbid painting. The fairy's pretty and pretty enough, but look at all those horrid red and yellow creatures with the googly eyes. Shut that book up quick, Mabe, said Mum, shuddering. No, I want to see the creatures with the googly eyes, said Robin, cramming the last spoonful of cornflakes into his mouth and then hiccuping. I wish you wouldn't bolt your food like that, sweetheart, and you don't want to see those nasty monsters, said Mum. I do, I do, said Robin. Put that book away, Mabe, said Mum. I raised my eyebrows, but, it, but stowed it back on the shelf obediently. Mum supervised Robin's teeth cleaning while I whizzed into the bedroom and checked on bindweed in my school bag. I gently eased her out of the sock. I've got some, you some lovely breakfast, I said. I would adore a sugary cornflake as big as a tea tray, but bindweed didn't seem very interested. She took two nibbles and then passed it back to me. I don't think she liked the taste very much, but she didn't complain. This worried me more than anything. You don't feel very well, do you, bindweed, I said. It was her turn to raise her tiny eyebrows. I feel a little faint, she murmured, but I'm sure I will revive when I see dear Wentworth. Perhaps you've got dehydrated from all that crying, I said. I pocketed a little china thimble patterned with cheeky elves from the living room mantelpiece. Bindweed pulled a face when she saw the picture, but drained the water gratefully, though it must have been like drinking direct from a bucket. It revived her a little, but not as much as I'd hoped. I felt very anxious. It would be terrible if one of the last fairies in the country died because I didn't look after her properly. It would all be my fault. I wrapped Bindweed up in the sock again, very tenderly, and tucked her back at the top of my school bag. I promise, I'm taking you to Wentworth today. Only don't blame me if you don't like it there anymore, I said. Mabe, who are you talking to? Robin asked, running into my room. He had toothpaste froth all around his mouth. I I'm not talking to anyone, I said quickly, buckling the straps of my school bag. Yes, you were. I heard you, said Robin. He was staring at my bag. You were talking to something in there. Oh, well... I promise not to tell, I said. I felt Bindweed scuttle in alarm to the bottom of the bag. I patted it to assure her, reassure her. I was, uh, I was just having a conversation with my mouse, I said, matter-of-factly. You haven't got a mouse, said Robin. Not a real one, a, a pretend one, I said. He's called Nibbles. Can I see him? Robin asked eagerly. There's nothing to see because he's pretend. I make him up. He keeps me company at school, I said. Because you haven't got many friends, said Robin. I winced. I suppose so, I said. Billy and those other girls are mean to you now, aren't they? Said Robin, and he came and gave me a hug. You can share my friends if you like. Robin's friends were all funny little kids who ran around the playground screeching like racing cars and laughing uproariously at fart jokes, but it was kind of them all the same. Thanks, but no thanks, I said, giving him a hug back. And you can share nibbles, but don't tell anyone or they'll laugh at us. Robin mind zipping his mouth and skipped off to find his own school bag. Maybe I'll have my own pretend mouse, he called over his shoulder. I shall call her Munchie. She can be Nibble's girlfriend. Then maybe they could have babies. That would be cool, wouldn't it? I bent and put my mouth to the flap of my school bag. It's all right, Bindweed, I whispered. Robin just thinks you're a mouse. I was proud of my quick thinking, but she was not impressed. It's not all right, Bindweed replied faintly. I am not a mouse, a common field creature with a twitching nose and an ungainly scuttle. How dare you? At least it had roused her a little. 
I'm sorry, I didn't mean to insult you. I was only trying to protect you, I said. Hmm, said Bindweed, and she paused. You will still take me to Wentworth, won't you? She said more politely. I will, I said firmly. Although finding a real fairy had been the most amazing thing ever, she was proving such a trial that I was beginning to think it would be a relief to say goodbye to her. And that is where we'll leave part three of Project Fairy by Jacqueline Wilson. I'll be back soon with lots more stories and videos coming your way on my channel. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for listening, guys. Take care. Bye bye. Hi, I really hope you're enjoying the content on my Dob Entertainment YouTube channel. If you are and you want more, then please feel free to head over to my Patreon page, link on the screen, where you will find extra content, including the entire Harry Potter series, the Hunger Games and my James Talks podcast. Lots more coming your way on there as well. If you're interested, head over and see if you can sign up for extra content. Thanks for your support as always, guys. Take care. Bye bye.